The F-22 Raptor is the most advanced of its breed, built around the first look, first shot, first kill ethos. The Raptor is a killing machine, just like the name implies. It's even more deadly when it gets out there and does the job. Deadly and undetectable at long range, this breathtaking fifth-generation fighter blends unmatched dogfighting with precision strike ground attack capabilities. Confidence lies in the fact these goals are achievable as a result of synergistic combination of characteristics and capabilities, including low observables, also known as stealth, the ability to cruise at supersonic speeds, or supercruise, over long range and without the use of afterburners, and an integrated and highly sophisticated avionics unit. Additionally, the FA-22A has been designed to be more maneuverable, better armed, more reliable, more easily maintained, more readily supportable, and more capable in the air-to-ground mission than any other comparable aircraft in history. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the Soviets developed different missiles to attack in different altitude bands. You couldn't fly under the missile threat, you couldn't fly over the missile threat, you had to deal with the missile threat. One way to do that is to make suppression of enemy air defense, that is, destroying the missile sites in the radars, the most important mission for the Air Force. By the 1970s, air superiority had re-emerged as a top priority, and the US Air Force committed to building its first pure air superiority fighter, an aircraft that would eventually become the F-15 Eagle. But just as the F-15s became operational in 1978, Alarming new evidence suggested that the new fighter's superiority might only be temporary. Reconnaissance satellites had photographed several new fighter prototypes, the Mikoyan MiG-29 and Sukhoi T-10 at the Raminskoy Flight Test Center outside of a small city of Zakovsky, about 40 miles southeast of Moscow. This new generation of Russian fighters represented a significant improvement in capability over anything previously observed by U.S. intelligence services. It was obvious to all concerned that a new air-to-air -air combat platform would be required to counter the new threat these new Russian aircrafts represented. The Sukhoi T-10 came as a huge shock to Western analysts. It was bigger than the F-15 and far bigger than any previous Soviet-built fighter. If the MiG-29 had concerned the American military establishment, the existence of the Sukhoi T-10 set alarm bells ringing. These are very good aircraft, aircraft that can play in the same league as some of the top NATO fighters like Phantom and ultimately like F-15. Just weeks into his first term, America's 40th president increased U.S. defense spending by $32.5 billion and began the rearmament of the United States on a colossal scale. The goal is world peace. It is absolutely essential that we increase our spending for national defense if we're to preserve the peace. As Reagan and Brezhnev squared up, the U.S. Air Force concluded that it would urgently need a new replacement for its F-15, an advanced tactical fighter, or ATF, that would have no equal. As American planners start to develop the concept of air-land battle to fight World War III, the U.S. Air Force starts to think about the kind of equipment it wants to have when it comes to fighting the war. Two sub-projects were established under this banner. The Advanced Tactical Fighter, which included concept and technology development, seven airframe companies being Boeing, General Dynamics, Grumman, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, Northrop, and Rockwell. Each received concept development investigation contracts for $1 million. And the Joint Fighter Engine, which was an engine technology demonstration program to be managed jointly with the U.S. Navy, Pratt & Whitney, and General Electric, each received contracts valued at $202 million during September of 1983. The seven competing companies submitted some 19 conceptual designs. From these, it was concluded that the ideal air-to-air -air platform would offer low observables in combination with supercruise and superior maneuverability. Analysis of air-to-air -air combat in Vietnam, called the Red Baron Study, had kickstarted the race for stealth. The principle of stealth technology is to literally make an airplane invisible to the enemy, 
An aircraft's shape must reflect incoming radio waves away from the enemy radar, rather than towards it. To further increase low observable characteristics, an airplane is then covered in materials that absorb radar signals, further reducing its visibility on radar screens. Leading the way in stealth technology was Lockheed Skunk Works Division. In 1977, amid unprecedented security, Lockheed had flown a prototype of the world's first stealth fighter, The U.S. Air Force decided that any new fighter must incorporate stealth technology and identified two other areas in which a future air superiority fighter should excel. The challenge had been issued. Now, it was up to the finest aviation manufacturers in the world to respond. The Advanced Tactical Fighter Program was about to begin, and the Raptor, America's fifth-generation fighter, was about to be hatched. By 1983, U.S.-Soviet relations had reached a new low. Following Leonid Brezhnev's death, the Politburo, now controlled by ex-KGB boss Yuri Andropov, had been labeled by Reagan as the focus of evil in the modern world. That August, when Korean Airline Flight 007 on its way to Seoul from New York strayed several hundred miles off course into Soviet airspace, Russia acted. A fighter was sent up, and the civilian airliner with 269 people on board was shot down. A shooting down of KAL-007 sent shockwaves around the world, straining international relations almost at a breaking point. Reagan's reaction to the crisis strengthened U.S. conviction that stealth would now be the prime requirement for America's new fighter. Following some four initial drafts, the basic framework for the ATF requirement, calling for a radius of action of approximately 800 miles, supersonic cruise capability of 1.4 to 1.5 Mach, a 2,000 feet runway requirement, a gross takeoff weight of 50,000 pounds, and a unit cost of no more than 40 million in 1985 dollars was released to industry. Importantly, implied in the proposal was a requirement that the ATF life cycle cost be at least as good as, if not better than, the McDonnell Douglas F-15. It was concluded that Lockheed and Northrop's submissions were superior to those of Boeing, General Dynamics, and McDonnell Douglas. Lockheed had conducted consortium discussions with Boeing and General Dynamics as early as June of 1986, but did not formalize an agreement with its partners until the following October 13. Consequently, Lockheed assigned Sherman Mullen as general manager for the ATF team program office. Mullen, would direct Lockheed in the prime contractor role and consequently take advantage of the unique technical strengths represented by Boeing and General Dynamics. Northrop, some two weeks later, followed suit by serving as lead on team with McDonnell Douglas. Thus, by default, the two consortia were selected on October 31, 1986, to build two prototypes, each to complete in revised demonstration and validation phase. Lockheed, under a $691 million contract, would build two of what later would become its Model 1132 aircraft under the official Air Force designation YF-22. Northrop, under a similar $691 million contract, would build two of its N-14 prototypes under the official Air Force designation YF-23, and in 1990, just months after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the shapes of the two rival designs were finally unveiled. Northrop's version, called the YF-23, closely resembled its original design. In contrast, Lockheed's design, called the YF-22, seemed surprisingly conventional. With four tail surfaces, vectored thrust, a broad solid body, and a conventional wing. But unlike Lockheed's other stealth aircraft, the F-117, radar-absorbent materials, were not applied over the whole of the F-A-22, but used selectively on its edges, cavities, and crucial surface areas. The F-22 carries its weapons internally. Four weapon bays are hidden in the central mid-body section. Six missiles can be carried in the ventral bays, which are covered by bifold doors. The side bays will each hold one Sidewinder missile, carried on a trapeze launcher. The mid-body section also houses the fighter's landing gear and complex inlet ducts. Attached to the mid-body is the forebody, 
which accommodates the cockpit and advanced avionics. Both the YF-23 and the YF-22 are impressive-looking machines, but their performance still needs to be tested. The most crucial stage of the competition is still to come, the flight testing. Northrop was first in the air. In August 1990, flown by Paul Metz, the YF-23 got airborne. The test was a huge success. But Lockheed was quick to respond, and, on September the 29th, at Edwards Air Force Base in California, Lockheed's chief test pilot Dave Ferguson prepared the Raptor for its maiden flight. Over the next three months, the Raptor underwent a whole series of tests. The Air Force required both teams to give them performance projections, and they were actually going to compare that with what the planes actually did in flight subsonic and supersonic at different altitudes and so forth. The winner of this stage would earn a contract for 650 aircraft. The decision would hinge not just on what the contractors promised, but on the Air Force's confidence in their ability to deliver. During flight testing, the Raptor had beaten Northrop's YF-23 in a number of crucial performance areas. The YF-22 had clearly shown that in every category, it was far superior to any existing fighter. The Air Force was very, very impressed by what Lockheed had done, but their flight test program was very aggressive. They flew hard and fast. They flew many more hours and sorties than Northrop did, and all of that gave the Air Force confidence that they knew what they were doing, and they could build a superior plane. But it would be events in 1991 that would carve out the Raptors' future. 22 minutes after midnight on January the 17th, 1991, Lockheed's stealth F-117 spearheaded U.S. strikes against Saddam Hussein's regime. The performance of Lockheed's stealth bombers during Operation Desert Storm would give the company and its aircraft some priceless publicity. The F-15, the aircraft destined to be replaced by the ATF, had emphatically confirmed its status as the foremost air superiority fighter in the world. Now, it appeared that the need for an advanced stealth fighter, the F-22, might be totally unfounded. But not everyone agrees. By April 1991, bogged down by the F-15 debate, the U.S. Air Force prepares to announce the winner of the advanced tactical fighter contract. But would the Raptor be able to emerge from the controversy unscathed? After the Dem Vell flight test of the prototypes, Secretary of the USAF Donald Rice announced the Lockheed team and Pratt & Whitney as the winners of the ATF and engine competitions. The YF-23 design was considered stealthier and faster, while the YF-22, with its thrust vectoring nozzles, was more maneuverable as well as less expensive and risky. Having won the contract, Lockheed announced that it intended to locate the F-22's headquarters in Georgia, where the Raptor's forward fuselage would be built. General Dynamics were to build the F-22's mid-body section in Fort Worth, Texas, and Boeing would manufacture the wings and tail in Seattle, Washington. Follow-on work using this aircraft took place at the Edwards Air Force Base. It was to consist of an additional 100 hours of flying time, or approximately 25 flights to expand the YF-22A's flight envelope and explore select envelope segments in greater detail. But, on April 25, 1992, the program hit its first major snag. During preliminary testing, the unthinkable happened. A YF-22 flown by Tom Morganfield crashed just after takeoff. The aircraft hit the runway with the landing gear up and slid approximately 8,000 feet and caught fire. Despite the loss of the stealth aircraft, the program had achieved its major goals. 10 million man-hours of analysis, 4,000 hours of radar testing and hundreds of hours of flight testing had gone into the development of the aircraft, even before construction was given the go. In fact, the F-22 has accomplished more flight testing than any other fighter prior to full-scale production. On April 9th, the first F-22A, officially named Raptor, an earlier attempt to make the name of the aircraft superstar failed in 1991, 
was rolled out in a public ceremony at Lockheed Martin's Marietta, Georgia facility for the first time. Now, Air Force pilots would get the opportunity to check up on the new aircraft for themselves. First flown by the Air Force in 1997, pilots at Edwards Air Force Base have surpassed 2,000 flight test hours in more than 900 missions. One of the key advances in the Raptor's design is its advanced cockpit and integrated avionics system. Key mission systems include Sanders General Electric Electronic Warfare System, Martin Marietta Infrared and Ultraviolet Missile Launch Detector, Westinghouse Texas Instruments Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar, TRW Communication Navigation Identification Sweep, and Long Range Advanced IRST. The radio frequency receivers of the Electronic Support Measures System give the aircraft the ability to perform intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance tasks. The F-22 has a glass cockpit with all digital flight instruments. The monochrome head-up display offers a wide field of view and serves as a primary flight instrument. Information is also displayed upon six color liquid crystal display, or LCD panels. This airplane displays information to you, it gives you knowledge of the battle space, it's all about seeing what's out there in front of you, and being able to make the right decisions about what to engage and when to engage it. The ejection seat is a version of the ACES-2, commonly used in USAF aircraft, with a center-mounted ejection control. The Raptor carries a formidable array of ordnance. The F-22 has three internal weapon bays, a large main bay on the bottom of the fuselage, and two smaller bays on the sides of the fuselage aft of the engine inlets. The main bay is split along the center line and can accommodate six launchers for beyond visual range missiles, and each side bay has a launcher for short range missiles. The primary air to air missiles are the AIM 120 AMRAM and the AIM 9 Sidewinder, with planned integration of the AIM 260 JATN. Missile launches require the bay doors to be open for less than a second, during which pneumatic or hydraulic arms push missiles clear of the aircraft. This is to reduce vulnerability to detection and to deploy missiles during high-speed flight. While the F-22 typically carries weapons internally, the wings include four hardpoints, each rated to handle 5,000 pounds or 2,300 kilos. Each hardpoint can accommodate a pylon that can carry a detachable 600-gallon or 2,270-liter external fuel tank for a launcher holding two air-to-air -air missiles. And to complement the Raptor's armament of eight missiles, the fighter also has a gun. An internally mounted M61A2 Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon is embedded in the airplane's right wing route with the muzzle covered by a retractable door. The radar projection of the cannon's fire path is displayed on the pilot's head-up display. But since Desert Storm, critics of the F-22 program claim that the F-15 Eagle, destined to be replaced by the Raptor, already had the attributes necessary to remain the world's preeminent air superiority fighter. In March 2003, Supporters of the F-15 got the opportunity to see whether or not the Eagle was still the best fighter in the sky. Five F-15s would go head-to-head -head with a single Raptor. Although no missiles would be used during the exercise, the sorties would closely resemble actual combat. No quarter would be given by either side. This was a kill or be killed exercise. All five F-15s are flown by experienced F-22 pilots. One by one, the Raptor brings them down. In combat testing with F-15s, the F-22 Raptor has emphatically proven its doubters wrong. In December 2005, the U.S. Air Force announced that the F-22 had achieved initial operational capability. During exercise Northern Edge in Alaska in June 2006, in simulated combat exercises, 12 F-22s downed 108 adversaries with no losses. In the exercises, the F-22 amassed 241 kills against two losses in air-to-air -air combat, with neither loss being an F-22. The F-22 cannot be exported under U.S. federal law to protect its stealth technology and classified features. Customers for U.S. fighters are acquiring earlier designs such as the F-15 Eagle and F-16 Fighting Falcon, or the newer F-35 Lightning II, which contains technology from the F-22, but was designed to be cheaper, more flexible, and available for export. 
The USAF had originally planned to buy a total of 750 ATFs. In 2009, the program was cut to 187 operational aircraft due to high costs. A lack of air-to-air -air missions due to the focus on counterinsurgency operations at the time of production, a ban on exports, and development of the more affordable and versatile F-35, with the last F-22 delivered in 2012. America's F-22 Raptor was created out of the Cold War fear that the Russian-made fighters would sweep aside the F-15s. The United States Air Force is the only operator of the F-22. As of August 2022, it has 183 aircraft in its inventory. In today's changing world, there are few certainties. But the rule of the Raptor, America's air dominance fighter of the skies, is one of them.
Well, I've been fortunate enough to uh, fly the F-16 for 13 years, and I flew the F-15C for about a year. Uh, those are great platforms. They do a great job, and they're a lot of fun to fly. Uh, but having flown this now for about a year and a half, I'll tell you, I enjoy flying this aircraft out of all three of them much, much better. Uh, the performance, it's a, it's a large airplane. It's a little bit heavier than an F-15, but it performs like the F-16. I mean, it, it'll turn on a dime and uh, it just handles like a dream. In the Raptor, what happens is it takes in all these signals and it does all the calculation for you and displays it in one display. So you look down at that display and it displays the battle space for you. So you spend more time instead of worrying about what the battle space looks like, what your next move is, because you know what the battle space looks like, the jet tells you that. So I would say this jet is much more easy to employ weapons than any other aircraft I've ever flown. I started flying out in Cessnas in Gainesville, Florida, in uh, Cessna 172s and 152s. And uh, after I got in the Air Force, uh, I got so busy that I kind of let my license kind of slip a little bit there. But a couple years back, when I was down at Maxwell Air Force Base assigned there, I went ahead and got my license back up to speed. And that way I could take my family up and take my wife and my kids up and let them fly around a little bit in an aircraft. So I still love to go up in the Cessnas. I still have a blast in them. I just love to fly. It is an absolute thrill to fly this jet. This jet handles uh, like a dream. So when you have the opportunity to actually take this thing off and fly it, I, I feel lucky every time I just get to sit in a seat and go fly. Uh, it's just an exciting day for me to, to go to work. It, it is very, um, what we call user-friendly airplane. It, it's very easy to fly. Now, employing as a weapon system, that's a little bit different. That takes some training and it takes a lot of hard uh, practice and work to get good at that. I really want these folks to understand what this airplane's about and let them make their own judgments uh, about what they see in this aircraft and what they hear from the guys that maintain it and from the guys that operate it. If they hear the truth, it'll sell itself because this jet is that revolutionary and that uh, significant to our forces that I want them to understand this and it's this is their aircraft. We're just the lucky souls that get to go out and fly it every day for them, but uh, this aircraft is made to protect them. They pay for it and uh, I want them to understand how, how what a good weapon system they've, they've bought here.
going to get.